So he took him by the hand again and led him into a very dark and dreary and dismal room where there sat a man in an iron cage. Now, the man, to look on him, seemed very, very sad. He sat with his eyes looking down to the ground, his hands folded together, and he sighed as if he would break his heart. What means this? Why is this man locked in this iron cage? And why doth his heart break so? Ask him. He will tell thee. Sir, what art thou? I am what I was not once. What wast thou once? Oh, I was once in my youth a fair and flourishing professor of religion. Well, but what art thou now? I am now a man of despair, and am shut up in it as in this iron cage. I cannot get out. Oh, now I cannot. But how camest thou into this condition? Oh. I left off to pray. I ceased to watch and be sober. I laid the reins of reason upon the neck of my lusts. I sinned against the light of the word and the goodness of God. I have grieved the spirit and he is gone. I tempted the devil, and he has taken me. Dear interpreter, is there no hope for such a man as this? Ask him. Is there no hope, sir, <laughs> but that you must be kept in this iron cage of despair? No, none at all. Why not? The son of the blessed is very pitiful. He can yet forgive. Oh, no. He cannot forgive me. But he can. No. Oh, he cannot. Why not? Because I cannot repent. I have crucified him to myself afresh. I have despised his person. I have despised his righteousness. I, I have counted his blood an unholy thing. I have done despite to the spirit of grace. Therefore, I have shut myself out of all the promises. And there now remains to me nothing but threatenings, <laughs> dreadful threatenings, fearful threatenings of certain judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour me as an adversary. For what <laughs> price did you oh. bring yourself into <laughs> this condition? Oh, for the last the pleasures, the profits of this world, in the enjoyment of which I did then promise myself much delight. But now every one of those things returns to bite me and gnaw me like a burning worm. But canst thou not now repent and turn? No, I told you that I cannot. God will not be trifled with after what I have done to him. He hath left me. He hath denied me repentance. His word gives me no encouragement to believe, yea, himself hath shut me up in this 
Iron Cage, nor can all the men in the world let me out. Oh, eternity, eternity, how can I accept <laughs> the loss of eternity? Let this man's misery be remembered by thee, and be an everlasting caution to thee. It shall. But pray tell, good sir, why hath God shut him up in this iron cage? Tis not God hath shut him up thus. Then who? Tis Satan who be the builder of cages. God hath revealed himself as one who came to set the captives free. Then why may he not set this man free? Because sin hath blinded his eyes to the mercy of God. He cannot believe that God can forgive him. And what man cannot believe, God cannot achieve. Then were this man able to believe, could he yet be free? Aye. Are there many that be in such a state? Yea, verily. There be multitudes that believe their sins to be so great that God cannot forgive them. They thus make their sins to be greater than the power of God. Then is it so what I have read? According to your belief, so be it unto you? I, the arm of faith, has been so badly withered by sin that it cannot reach forth to grasp God's mercy. Did they not know that this would happen? Nay. They verily thought they could lead a life of sin and then turn to God in their own good time. But when the pleasures of sin were past and they would exercise their faith, they found that it had been bound up in the steel chains of their sins. Then I pray God to help me to watch and be sober, and to pray that I may shun the cause of this man's misery. But, sir, is it not yet time to put me upon my way? Tarry yet until I show thee one thing more, and then shalt thou go on thy way. So he took Christian by the hand again, and led him into a chamber where there was one rising out of bed. And as he put on his raiment, he shook and trembled. Ah, ta tarry yet until I show thee one thing more, and then shalt thou go on thy way. So he took Christian by the hand again, and led him into a chamber where there was one rising out of bed. And... As he put on his raiment, he shook and trembled. Ah! Why doth this man thus tremble and cry out? Sleeper, tell this pilgrim why thou didst so do. This night, as I was in my sleep, I dreamed a dream, and behold, the heavens grew exceeding black. Also, it thundered. It lightened in the most fearful wise. Say on. So I looked up in my dream. And I saw the clouds racked by at a terribly great speed. Indeed. And then I heard a great sound of a trumpet and saw also a man sitting on a cloud. A man? Yes. His hair was white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. His voice was as the sound of many waters. And his, his face did shine bright as the sun. Indeed. And on his vesture and on his thigh was a name written, King of Kings. Lord of Lords! T'was our Lord Jesus! Yes, I fear so! And he was attended with the glittering thousands of heaven. They were all in flaming fire. Also the heavens were in a burning flame. It was a great day of God. Yes, he came near the earth. And then he called with a voice like a trumpet. Come forth! Come forth! Then what? With that the rocks rent. The graves were opened, and the dead in Christ came forth, prepared to meet their Lord in the air. Glory be! But there came up as well Annas and Caiaphas, and others of those who had pierced him. Yea, for he told them that they would see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, 
and coming in the clouds of heaven. Aye, these vainly thought to hide themselves, and they cried for the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them. Go on. And then, then I heard it said to those who attended upon the king, Gather my wheat into the garner. The rapture of the righteous. Yes, and with that, I saw many catched up and carried away into the clouds. Oh, glorious day. No, no, an evil day. Why sayest that? Because I was left behind. What? Yes, left behind. Then what? Then I heard it proclaimed by the king. Gather together the tares, the chaff, the stubble, and cast them into the burning lake. And with that, the bottomless pit opened. You saw it? Saw it. I felt it. It opened just where I stood, out of the mouth of which there came smoke, coals of fire, and hideous noises. So terrible a dream, then what? Upon this, I awakened from my sleep. But what would cause thee to dream such a dream? Hast thou dreamed it before? Aye, it doth haunt me every night. Can it be God is sending thee warning? Tell me. Hast thou perchance sins unforsaken? Nay, nay, none. Sleeper, speak truth. Well, all right. But tis only a little one, a tiny one. Thou must forsake it, then, for the law stands at the gate and will not let one stain upon thy garment pass through. I know, and so do I intend to do. When? Oh, soon. Do it now. No, for such a small sin soon will do well enough. But you must... Soon. Soon. But thou art in danger of becoming like the man in the cage. Not so. Why not so? Because his sins were great ones. Mine is the tiniest of the tiny. But it will grow. Nay, I will not let it. But you must... Come. But... Come. But I must needs convince him. You cannot. But he hath sincere intent to change soon. Aye, but soon never comes. It moves on ahead of us like a receding mirage in a dry and thirsty land. He who thinks to change soon waits for eternity. Oh, dear. Consider well these things. I do. And they put me in hope and in fear. Keep all things so in thy mind. To keep thee in the way thou must go. I shall. The lessons have been good. And now? Now you may be off. Thinkest thou that soon I shall be loosed from my burden? Aye. When? Sooner than you think, but longer than you wish. And now, dear pilgrim, Godspeed. Ah, Happy I am to be on my way. Farewell, good interpreter. I thank thee for thy many lessons. The comforter be always with thee, good Christian, to guide thee into the way that leads to the city. Now I saw in my dream that the highway up which Christian was to go was fenced on either side with a wall that was called Salvation. Up this way, therefore, did burdened Christian run, but not without great difficulty because of the load that was on his back. He ran thus till he came to a place somewhat ascending, and high upon the top of that place stood a cross, and a little below in the valley a sepulchre. So I saw in my dream that Christian with great effort did climb to the foot of the said cross and gazed with wonder upon one suffering there. And it was so that as soon as he came up even with the cross, his burden loosed from off his shoulders and fell from off his back and began to tumble and so continued to do till it came to the mouth of the sepulcher where it fell in and I saw it no more. Then was Christian glad and lightsome, and said with a merry heart, He hath given me rest by his sorrow, and life by his death. The innocent hath suffered for the guilty, and by his stripes am I healed. Oh, praise him! Then he stood still a while to look, 
and wonder. For it was very surprising to him that the sight of the cross should thus so effectively ease him of all his burden. He looked, therefore, and looked again, even till the springs that were in his head sent the water down his cheeks. Oh, my Lord, is it truly for love of me that thou dost so suffer? Is it truly my sins that have broken thine heart so? Oh, then must I praise thee as long as within me there be breath. Now as he stood looking and weeping, behold, three shining ones came to him and saluted him. Peace be unto thee. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Is it truly so? Can it truly be? Did not thy burden roll into yon sepulchre? Aye, but just as it is when one takes off his hat, and yet seems to wear it still, so does it seem in a sense that my burden doth still rest upon my back. Thou must not consult with thy feelings, but rather with the words of him that hath cast thy sins into the depths of the sea. Then. By his promised word, they are truly gone. Aye, and no one can bring it back, except thee. By what way? By leaving off to watch and pray, and turning again to the beggarly elements of this life, by partaking again of thy former evil ways, even as a dog doth return to his vomit. Oh, that I might never so do. The choice is thine alone. I will be true, for there are those who trust me. I, chiefly he that doth suffer for thee, he shall lead thee as your shepherd through all of your travels. When at last you come at the far side of your journey, he shall greet thee there. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied, for thou art precious in his sight. Thus I am determined it shall be. Christian. Yes? This be for thee. Why, a new suit of clothes. Aye, put them on. But I have no money to buy such fine habits. They are yours, without money and without price. Then to whom do I owe my thanks for these goodly garments? To him whom thou dost behold suffering for thee. They are his? Aye, his. He hath woven them in the loom of heaven by his own hand. Why, they fit perfectly. Aye. And they are without spot, nor wrinkle. Nor have they in them one thread of human devising. This goodly coat hath no seams. This be thy wedding garment, the which, if thou wear it faithfully, shall give thee an abundant entrance into the wedding supper of the Lamb. There he shall serve thee with his own hand. And what of my filthy rags, all here in a pile? They stay here, at the foot of the cross, unless thou draw back. That can by no means be. I have put my hand to the plough. Amen. Christian. Yes? This be for thee. Why, tis a branding iron, such as evil convicts are branded with. Aye. And it doth glow hotly reddish. Aye, because it has lain upon a live coal from off the altar. What is it for? To put a mark upon your forehead. Must I truly be so disfigured with such a mark? Tis the mark of ownership. Of who? Of he, who upon the cross doth buy thy soul at the price of his own. I draw me back from such a scar. Is not he upon the cross guard because of thee? I. Is the servant better than his lord? No. I be ashamed of my fear. Stand thou still. Doth it greatly hurt? Know ye not that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which thou shalt inherit hereafter? I have thine own way, lord. Stand thou still. Uh, 
finished. Why, it seems to have hurt me not at all. Because he hath borne the pain for thee. Had I known, I would not have been so hesitating. Had you known, it would have been no test. Why doth he ever test us? Because the devil doth continually accuse thee of being unworthy to walk in white. But when thou pass his appointed tests, our Lord doth rebuke him by pointing to thy faithfulness. Ah, oh, thanks be that the test was not too difficult for me. The test will never be too difficult for thee. He will not suffer thee to be tempted above what thou art able to bear. Thanks be to God. I... Yes? Forgive my curiosity, but might I look upon my wound? Here be a glass. Why, I see no mark at all. Tis a mark that man cannot see. It can be seen only by those who put it there. To what purpose? It shows us who are his. Ah. Here. Why, tis a parchment roll, tied with a seal. Tis for you to read as you run your course. Thank you. See that thou open it often, for it grows stiff and hard to manage if you leave it closed up for any long time. I shall. Also, thou must present it before thee when thou dost come at the celestial gate. Therefore, see that thou lose it not. Oh, I shan't. Thank you. Thank you very much. Farewell, good Christian. Yes, God be with thee. God be with thee. Farewell, my friends. May we meet again. You shall have our company all along your journey, though thou may see us not. Godspeed. Goodbye. Then did Christian give three leaps for joy. Hurrah! Free! At last, free! I saw then in my dream that he went on thus, even until he came to the bottom, where he saw, a little out of the way, three men fast asleep, with fetters of iron upon their heels. The name of one was Simple, of another, Sloth, and of the third, Presumption. Christian, then, seeing them lie in this case, went to them, if peradventure he might awake them. Gentlemen, you behave like soldiers asleep on their watch. What? Wake up! Wake up, I say! Tis not safe to fall asleep on the road to Zion. There is danger. What? Is there danger, do you say? Yes. Awake, therefore, and come away. Here, I will help you off with your irons. Ah, we are doing just fine. Go away. No. If he that goeth about like a roaring lion comes by, he will certainly become prey to his teeth. Lions? I don't see no roaring lions. He cometh when you look not for him. Awake out of sleep. I told you I don't see no danger. Go away. You there. Wake up. <sighs> Get a little more sleep, then I shall join thee. Thou must awake now. For now it is high time to awake out of sleep. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Thou art right, and I shall join thee in a little while. But first I must get my rest. No, you can rest later. Come. But the way is hard, and he who has called us is a hard taskmaster. Therefore, oh, oh I, I've got to save up my strength for my journey. Uh, thou dost bury thy talent in the earth. Nay, I do but preserve it whole without one speck missing. And you... Wilt not thou be made free and follow on with me? Soon. Soon doth never come. Not so, for I have seen it come and go many times. Thou must act now, for the time is far spent. We have been in this way longer than thou. If there be such an urgency to be off full in a huff, the Lord of the way will make it known unto us before thee. How? We shall surely feel a burning in our breasts, or at least an article in the church paper. Aye, at least an article. 
But he hath given us command that we sleep not as others. We must be diligent and press forward toward the high calling that is set before us. We await the latter rain to fit us up. It would be foolish to run before the time appointed. But... And now be off with you. We are in the way of life, and for now that be enough. Nay, but thou must show forth thy calling to this way by travelling forward in it. Bah! Thou speakest of legalism. Knowest thou not that twas all finished at the cross? Off with you. But... Away, I say. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. But I speak the truth. As thou dost understand it. No, let us resume our sleep. It may be that God will give one of us a dream to confirm uh, thy warnings of danger. A dream, yes. A dream, yes. And so they lay down to sleep again, and Christian went on his way. Yet was he troubled to think that men in that danger should so little esteem the kindness of him that so offered help to them, both by awakening of them, counseling them, and proffering to help them off with their irons. And as he was troubled thereabout, he espied two men come tumbling over the wall on the left of the narrow way. Uh, with you. Now the name of the one was Formalist. You make it down all right? And the name of the other was Hypocrisy. I <laughs> down I am. Good. Let's be on our way. They soon drew near unto Christian, who thus entered with them into discourse. Gentlemen, whence from and whither bound? We were born in the land of vainglory. And we both be bound for praise to Mount Zion. But why came you not in at the gate, which standeth at the beginning of the way? Gate? What gate? The wicked gate, manned by a great one named Goodwill. Tis too far out of our way. What? Know ye not that it is written? He that cometh not in by the door, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber? That by no means applies to us. No, not us. Everyone from the land of vain glory, whence we be come, are in agreement that the way back to the wicket gate be too far. Therefore, it is that we follow the custom of our people, and have taken a shortcut over the wall. But will it not be counted a trespass against the lord of the city whither we are bound, thus to violate his revealed will? Thou need not trouble thy head about that. Why not? Because what we do we have custom for. Custom? Yes, custom. Custom long-standing. If you should require it of us, we could produce testimony that our custom is over 1,000 years old. Indeed. Indeed. But will it stand a trial at law? There can certainly be no doubt in any rational mind that a custom which has so ably withstood the passage of time and which has served to get so many into the way could surely only be counted legal by any impartial judge. And besides, if we get into the way, what matter is it which way we get in? But no buts to it. To be in is to be in. Oh, I don't know. Listen to logic, friend. Thou art in the way, correct? Oh, surely, I. Now thou camest in at the gate, correct? I. And we came tumbling over the wall, correct? I. You are in the way. We are in the way. Now how doth our condition differ? How art thou better than us? Chiefly in this. I walk by the rules laid down by my master, while you walk by the rude working of your fancies. Tis custom! You are counted thieves already by the lord of the way. Therefore do I doubt you will be found to be true men at the end of the way. Did you hear? Thieves he calls us. What nerve! Tis true. You came in by yourselves without his direction, and you shall go out by yourselves without his mercy. So sayest thou. So sayest he. Watch thee out where thou puttest thy nose, friend. It is like to be bent. Aye, best look thee out to thine own self. 
and leave fellow travelers to their own peace and safety. Then I saw that they went on somewhat together, but each in his own way. After a period of silence, they began to speak thusly. <clears throat> As to the laws and ordinances given to govern our behavior while in this way, we doubt not but that we keep them as well as yourself. In fact, I would say that friend formalist here keeps them better than thou. Indeed. By laws and ordinances you will not be saved since you came not in by the door. Bah! We see not wherein thou differest from us, except perhaps by that uh, fine suit which thou wearest. These garments were given to me by the lord of the place whither I go. <laughs> to cover the shame of thy nakedness, I throw. Aye, and I take it as a token of his kindness to me, for I had nothing before but filthy rags. Well, look upon our garments. As fine as you are likely to see upon any in this way. But they have spots and wrinkles. We be traveling men, good fellow. Tis impossible to go this way without picking up a few spots here and there. Aye. Surely the Lord at the gate doth realize that the way is hard, and that stumbles be many. Tis at the gate that he will give us a change of garment. Not at the head of the way. Nay, but he that did weave them in the loom of heaven doth give them to us at the beginning, and doth grant us the power to keep them fully clean. And why should he do that? Because the clothes are his, and by their beauty is he judged. But the kingdom of heaven is not food or drink. Or clothes. Just so long as we are not filthy, or wretched, or blind, or naked, what does it matter? I what? I only know that when I come to the gate of the city, the Lord thereof will confess me before his father, because I have his coat upon my back, a coat that he gave me freely, in the day that I surrendered all. But any coat will do. Aye, just so long as we are clothed. I have, moreover, a mark in my forehead. Hmm. We, uh, we see no mark. Tis not for you to see, but for those who put it there. Whence came said mark? It came upon yonder skull-shaped hill, as I stood beneath the cross, just after I had surrendered all, and watched my burden tumble from off my shoulders. Well, in this we are better than thee. How so? In that we never had such a burden as you speak of. Then t'was this that enabled you to so nimbly tumble over the wall against the rules of the way. But he who begins his journey by leaving his burden at the cross ends his way with none. They that start with none and bypass the way of the cross shall be crushed beneath a stone when at last they shall see their need. <laughs> the man waxes poetic. <laughs> All right. So you do have a fine garment, and so you do have some invisible mark, and so you have left behind some imaginary burden on some skull-shaped hill. The fact remains that we, too, are in the way. I have also a roll, sealed, to comfort me by reading as I go in the way. I was also bid to give it in at the celestial gate, as a token that my admission therein, too, had been paid by him that hung upon the cross. All of these things, the garment, the mark, and the scroll ye do lack, because ye came not in at the gate. To these things they gave him no answer. Only they looked upon each other and laughed him to scorn. <laughs> <laughs> we have no garment because we were not naked. And no burden because of our good lives. And no mark because <laughs> if it cannot be seen, it cannot be needed. And no scroll for comfort, because we be in no need of said comfort. Being quite comfortable already, you see. Except when keeping company with thee. Therefore, alone may thou be. Farewell. Aye, farewell. <laughs> then I saw that they went on all, 
save that Christian kept before, who had no more talk but with himself, and sometimes sighingly, and sometimes comfortably. Also, he would be often reading in the roll that one of the Shining Ones gave him, by which he was refreshed. I beheld then that they all went on till they came to the foot of the hill Difficulty, at the bottom of which was a spring. There were also in the same place two other ways, one turned to the left hand and the other to the right. But the narrow way lay right up the hill. Christian now reached into the spring with his hand and brought the water to his mouth and was thus refreshed. Formalist and hypocrisy, however, fell on their faces before the spring and did drink directly with their mouth. Then did Pilgrim leave them and began to go up the hill. This hill, though high I covet to ascend, the difficulty will not me offend, for I perceive the way to life lies here. Come, pluck up, heart, let's neither faint nor fear. Better though difficult, the right way to go, than wrong though easy, where the end is woe. The other two also came to the foot of the hill. But when they saw that the hill was steep and high, and that there were two easier ways to go, and supposing also that by and by these two ways might meet again with the right way, they resolved to go on the easier ways. Now the name of one of those ways was Danger, and the name of the other Destruction. So the one took the way which is called Danger, which led him into a great wood, and the other took the way called Destruction, which led him into a wide field full of dark pits, where he stumbled and fell and rose no more. I looked then after Christian to see him go up the hill, where I perceived he went from running to walking, and from walking to clambering upon his hands and knees because of the steepness of the place. Now about the midway to the top of the hill was a pleasant arbor made by the lord of the hill for the refreshment of weary travelers. Thither, therefore, Christian got where also he sat down to rest him. Oh, a resting place prepared for poor pilgrims. Oh, here I may gain rest for my weariness and gather strength from my roll. Then he pulled his roll out of his bosom and read therein to his comfort. He also now began afresh to take a review of the coat or garment that was given him as he stood by the cross. Thus, pleasing himself a while, he at last stretched himself out on the bench and fell into a lightly slumber. Oh, rest, oh, sweet rest for the weary pilgrim. From thence he fell into a fast sleep which detained him in that place until it was almost night. And in his sleep, his roll fell out of his hand. Now, as he was sleeping, there came one to him and awaked him. Awake. Huh? Awake. Huh? What? Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. With that, Christian suddenly started up. Oh my, tis getting on to evening, uh, got to be on my way. He then sped on his way and went apace till he came to the top of the hill. Now when he was got up to the top of the hill, there came two men racing headlong. The name of the one was Timorous, 
and of the other, mistrust. <sighs> Sirs, what be the matter? You run the wrong way. Easy enough for you to say. Aye, we were on our way to the city of Zion, the same as you. And we had already gotten past this difficult place. Hard it was, too. We thought we would have the victory when we had gained the top, but instead we found that the farther we went, the more danger we met with. Indeed. Aye, truly it is a deadly, dangerous way we are in. Therefore it is that we have turned about and are going back again. Back? Yes, back. But this is the way. Walk ye in it. Easy to say, for you, from here. But we happen to know that just before us lie a pair of lions in the way. Lions? Aye, great lions. And whether sleeping or waking, we know not. And we could not help but think that if we came within reach, they would presently pull us to pieces. Therefore we advise thee to join us and turn back. Ye do make me afraid. Then be thou wise and join with us. But whither shall I fly to be safe? If I go back to my own country, I shall perish with it in fire and brimstone. But who knows when it will be destroyed? All things continue as from the beginning. You might live to be a ripe old age there. Only to sink beneath the heavy burden that shall come upon me again, and to perish in my sins. Oh, but if I can only somehow get to the celestial city, I am sure to be in safety there. I must venture. Thou goest into great danger from the two great lions. Right. The longer we stop to look at them, the greater they became. Methinks they be giant lions. Aye, we did seem as grasshoppers in our own eyes. The risk is great. And the land about them doth eat up the inhabitants thereof. Go back. No, though the lions be ten feet tall, yet to go back is certain death. To go forward is to only meet the fear of death. And if the fear be conquered by faith, why, I trow I shall find life everlasting beyond it. I will yet go forward. Thou art sure? I am sure. Well then, let me be off a ways before thou go on. Why so? Why, that I hear not the tearing of thy flesh and the crackling of thy bones, of course. Farewell. Best of luck to thee, foolish one. Farewell, though I see not how thou canst. So Mistrust and Timorous ran down the hill, and Christian went on his way. But thinking again of what he had heard from the men, he felt need of courage. So he felt in his bosom for his role, and, and found it not. Oh no, tis gone, tis gone. Oh, all undone am I. All undone. Then was Christian in great distress. He knew not what to do. For he now lacked that which used to relieve and strengthen him, and that which should have been his path into the celestial city. Where is it? Where could it be? At last, he bethought himself that he had slept in the arbor that is on the side of the hill. The arbor? The arbor, tis in the arbor where I slept. And falling down on his knees, he asked God's forgiveness for that foolish act, and then went back to look for his role. Oh, foolish man, foolish, foolish man. Oh, will it be yet there? Oh, foolish man. And all the way he went back, who can sufficiently set forth the sorrow of Christian's heart? Sometimes he sighed, sometimes he wept, and oftentimes he berated himself for being so foolish to fall asleep in that place, which was erected only for a little refreshment from his weariness. Thus, therefore, he went back, carefully looking on this side and on that, hoping to find the role that had so often been his comfort in his journey. At last, he gained sight of the arbor where he had sat, 
and slept. Which sight only served to increase his sorrow by bringing fresh to mind the evil of his sleeping. O oh, sinful sleep, O oh, wretched man that I am, that I should sleep in the daytime, that I should take ease in the midst of difficulty. How far might I have been on my way by this time? I am made to tread those steps thrice over which I needed not to have trod but once. Yea, also, now I am like to be benighted, for the day is almost spent. Oh, that I had not slept. Now, by this time, he was come to the arbor again, where, not finding his role, he sat down and wept. Oh, woe is me. All lost and undone am I. Woe, woe, woe. Here he sat for a while, all sad and weeping, when at last, as Providence would have it, looking sorrowfully down under the bench, he espied his roll, the which he, with trembling and haste, catched up and put it into his bosom. Oh, thank thee, dear God! Thank thee, thank thee, thank thee! Therefore, it was with joy and tears that he betook himself again to his journey. But oh, how nimbly now did he go up the rest of the hill, yet still before he got him up, the sun went down upon Christian, and this made him again recall the vanity of his sleeping. Oh, thou sinful sleep, how for thy sake I am like to be benighted in my journey. I must walk without the sun, darkness must cover the path of my feet. And I must hear the noise of the doleful creatures, all because of my sinful sleep. Now also he remembered the story that Mistrust and Timorous told him, of how they were affrighted with the sight of the lions. These beasts range in the night for their prey, and if they should meet with me in the dark, how shall I escape being torn into pieces? Thus he went on miserably in his way. But while he was thus bewailing his unhappy miscarriage, he lifted up his eyes, and behold, there were the lights of a very stately palace before him, the name of which was Beautiful, and it stood just by the highway side. So I saw in my dream that he made haste and went forward, that, if possible, he might get lodging there. Now before he had gone far, he entered into a very narrow passage, which had, near the end thereof, two lions in the way. Now I see the dangers that mistrust and timorous were driven back by. Oh, what shall I do? Now the lions were chained. But by reason of darkness, he saw not the chains, and so was greatly afraid, and thought to follow back with timorous and mistrust. What to do? Before me, almost certainly, lieth instant death, and yet behind me, more than certain, lies another death, albeit perhaps slower and not so violent. In this state, therefore, he halted in the way. Now at this point, the porter of the lodge, whose name is Watchful, perceiving that Christian made a halt as if he would go back, cried out to him, Is thy faith so small? Fear not the lions, for they are chained. Chained, you say? Yes, chained. They are placed there for the trial of faith to those that have it, and for the discovery of those that have none. Keep in the midst of the path, and no hurt shall come unto thee. Can it be? Can it truly be? Aye, only be certain not to venture too far left or too far right. Then I saw that he went on trembling for fear of the lions. But taking good heed to the directions of the porter, 
He walked nimbly on in the middle of the road. Not too far left, not too far right. Now as he approached the lions, they did awaken. Oh dear! And begin to stretch themselves to reach the middle of the road. Now, because of the lateness of the hour, the sun was far set, and Christian could scarce see clearly the path between the lions. Neither could he see the chains. Now do I dare go on? Are his words verily true? Do the lions wear chains? Thus did Christian come to a stop just before the lions to think thus with himself. If his words be not true, then I am entered upon a delusion. And if I am entered upon a delusion, then there be no hope for me. And if there be no hope for me, just as well that I die at the paw of the lion as to die of despair. Therefore I have nothing to lose and all to gain. Therefore I choose to believe his promise. The lions do wear chains. Then Christian, having chosen to believe the good words of the porter, went forward in faith. And passing through the midst of them, he smelt their warm breath blowing in his face, and felt the breeze that stirred by reason of their swinging paws. But he found that the uttermost reach of their sharp claws did fail of reaching his garment by a hair's breadth. And so he passed safely through them. Then he clapped his hands for joy and went on till he came before the gate where the porter was. Sir, I thank thee for thy good counsel. Twas only my duty. Sir, what house is this? And may I lodge here tonight? This house was built by the Lord of the Hill for the relief and security of pilgrims. May I then enter in? Who art thou? Whence be ye? And whither bound? My name is now Christian, formerly called Graceless. I am come from the city of destruction, and bound for the city of Zion. How is it that ye seek lodging so late? The sun is set, and the time for travel is far spent. I had been here hours sooner, but that wretched man that I am... I slept in the arbor that stands on the hillside. Ah, a common mistake. Even so, I would have gotten here much sooner, had I not, in my sleep, lost the parchment roll that is my pass into the celestial city. Well, I will call out one of the virgins of this place, who will, if she likes your talk, bring you into the rest of the family, according to the rules of this house. So watchful the porter rang a bell, at the sound of which came out of the door of the house a grave and beautiful damsel, named Discretion. Didst thou call, father? I, Discretion, my daughter. To what purpose? To examine this. See if he be worthy to lodge with us this night. Yes, father. Did you say you were bound for Mount Zion? Aye, ma'am. And become from the city of destruction? Aye, ma'am. How did you get into the way? I came in at the wicket gate. Not tumbling over the wall? Nay, but through the way provided. Then she asked him what he had seen and met with on the way. And he told her all. At last, she asked his name. My name is Christian, and I have so much the more a desire to lodge here tonight because by what I perceive, this place was built by the Lord of the Hill for the relief and security of pilgrims. 
So she smiled, but the water stood in her eyes. And after a little pause, she said, I will call forth two or three of my family. So she ran to the door and called out Prudence, Piety, and Charity, who, after a little more discourse with him, had him into the family. And many of them, meeting him at the threshold of the house, said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. This house was built by the Lord of the hill on purpose to entertain such pilgrims as you. Then he bowed his head and followed them into the house. So when he was come in and sat down, they gave him something to drink and consented together that until supper was ready, some of them, namely piety, prudence, and charity, should engage him in edifying conversation. Come, good Christian, since we have been so loving to you to receive you into our house this night, let us talk with you of all things that have happened to you in your pilgrimage. Yes, twill help us to wisely improve the time while we await dinner. With a very good will, and I am glad that you are so well disposed. Do be seated. Thank you. Do tell, what moved you at first to betake yourself to a pilgrim's life? I was driven out of my native country by the firm conviction that destruction did await me if I abode in that place where I was. But there be many roads marked as leading to Zion. How came you to be in the only right one? God sent a man unto me, whose name is Evangelist, and he did direct me to the wicket gate, where I was set in the way that hath led me directly to this house. And did you come by the house of the interpreter? Oh, yes and did see such things there, the remembrance of which will stick by me as long as I live. What manner of things? Three things especially, to wit, how Christ, in spite of Satan's work to put out our hope of salvation, yet maintains his work of grace in the heart. And yet that, secretly. Yes, he be hid behind the wall, so as to be seen only by the eye of faith. What else sticketh in thy mind? How the man in the iron cage had sinned himself quite out of the hopes of God's mercy. Ah, a sad case, his. His condition came by a persistent refusal to repent. And did you hear the sleeper recount his dream? Yes, his plight was one of the things that stand out in my mind. Do you know of the man? Oh, yes. He hath been intending to repent of his sin since my grandfather was a small child. Indeed. Then Interpreter was right. About what? About how soon doth never come, but recedes on before us like a mirage in the desert. Tis a sad story, his. Aye, especially that he suffered all because of one small sin unforsaken. A tiny one, he called it. Twas not tiny at all. He said it was. If it were so tiny, then why would he not trade it for all the riches of eternity? I don't know. I'd never thought of that. But a little thought will show that it was not a tiny sin at all, but instead greater to him than all the world. I think I understand. Twas a tiny sin for Adam to taste the apple, but in so doing, he did prefer the words of this serpent over the commands of God. From thence have sprung all the evil that doth so heavily despoil the world. Ah. Therefore it is that there are no tiny sins, and that no one clinging to a tiny sin shall be made glorious and immortal at the trump of God. Now I understand more clearly why he suffered so. He was choosing sin over Christ. Indeed. Was that all you saw at the house of the interpreter? Oh, no. There was much more. With that, he recounted all that had befallen him from the start of his way unto the meeting of the two great lions in the way. And truly, if it had not been for the good man whom you have to your father, telling me about the chains on the lions, I do not know but that I might have gone back. Many have. But do tell me, 
Why are the lions placed where they can so terribly frighten earnest pilgrims? They are there as a test of faith, namely to wit, whether or no the pilgrims will believe the word of God's messengers over the evidence of their senses. Truly, it seems a great test. Yes, but only failed by those who call God a liar. He that believeth the word of God cometh through straight on, as thou hast done, although others do have it easier than thou didst. In what way? In that they pass through in the light of day and can see with their eyes the chains we speak of. And so for me the test was made the greater, because I had slept in the way and lost my role. Yes. To fail one test is to make more difficult the next. Thanks be to God that I am here, and I thank you for receiving of me. Tomorrow morning you must go take a closer look at the lions. To what purpose? That thou mayest see that they have neither teeth nor claws. Indeed. Tis verily true. Then are they like the warriors at the drawbridge, who hoped never to win a battle. Yes. When we learn to see through the eyes of faith, it is soon seen that trials and temptations be mere paper dragons put in our path by Satan to frighten us away. Which thing I only hope I can remember. Dear Christian. Yes, Prudence. May I ask of thee a question or two more? Yea, please. Do you think sometimes of the country from whence you came? Yes, but that with much shame and detestation. Not with desire of returning? Truly, if I had been mindful of that country from whence I came out, I should have returned ere this. But I desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Do you not yet bear away with you some of the inner desires that you cherished in former times? Yes, but greatly against my will, especially my inward and carnal thoughts, thoughts with which all my countrymen, as well as myself, once took greatest delight. But now, every time such thoughts seek to cross my mind, they cause me grief and shame. Why so? Why... Because in my little book it doth say, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do you ever find that at certain times you have victory over temptations, which at other times completely vanquish you? Oh yes, I do wish my victories could be more consistent. When thou art victorious over said temptations, can you remember by what means you find yourself the victor? Well... Let me consider. For one thing, it always happens when I think of what I saw on the cross, when I behold him hanging there, and I see that when I do sin, I add yet another stripe to his back. Why, at such times carnal desire hath no power over me. When else? Uh, when I behold this fine broidered coat, woven in the loom of heaven, I see that when I surrender to my carnal thoughts, my coat begins to become stained and worn. But when I think of how this is proof of my salvation, and given by he that died for me, why I get me the victory, and it shines forth again all bright and shiny new. When else? Also when I look into the roll that I carry in my bosom. That will do it too. And when my thoughts wax warm about whither I am going, that will also do it. Then thou hast found the keys to consistent victory, hast thou not? Why, verily, it doth seem I have. If I would but choose to think continually upon these things, then sin would have no power over me. I could ever walk in the sunshine of victory. T'was thus that your Lord and Master did get his victory over the world, over the flesh, and over the devil. Then may I do the same? Can it be so? Thou mayest, if thou wilt do these things, and yet two more. Being what? First, you must decide that at the very first approach of evil, you will turn instantly from beholding it, and cry unto thy Lord for help. I can do that. What else? When the world, or the flesh, 
or the devil yet seem to tempt thee, thou must cast in their face the words of Scripture, as did our Lord Jesus. What doth this do? The word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, doth cut and hack them so terribly sore that they must soon retire from the conflict. Why, herein is a marvelous thing. Tis because the word of God is creative and alive. When we believe that the word of God can do what it says it can do, and when we depend upon that word only to do what it says it will do, then is all the power of heaven at our command. Then, by keeping my thoughts upon heavenly things, and by being instant in prayer, and by quickly drawing the word of God, I may be as a warrior that never loseth a battle. Thou dost begin to understand. Now there is only the application of what thou hast learned. And that I shall do henceforth. Dear Christian. Yes, Charity. Do tell. What makes thee so desirous to go to Mount Zion? Why, there I hope to see him alive, that did hang dead on the cross in my place, and there I will be rid of all those fleshly desires that are yet an annoyance to me. There also there is no death and no crying, but best of all, I shall be put into his company, whom to know is life eternal. Thou dost love him, then. Oh, yes, I love him greatly, because that he first loved me. Have you a family? Are you a married man? I, I have a wife and four small children. And why did you not bring them along with you? Oh, how willingly would I have done it. But they were all of them utterly averse to my going on pilgrimage. But you should have talked to them and endeavored to have shown them the danger of staying behind. So I did, and told them also what God had shown me of the destruction of our city. But I seemed to them as one that mocked, and they believed me not. And did you pray to God that he would bless your counsel to them? Yes, and that with much affection. For you must know that my wife and poor children were very dear unto me. But what could they say for themselves? Why they came not? Why, my wife was afraid of losing this world. And my children were given to the foolish delights of youth. So, what by one thing and what by another, they left me to wander in this manner alone. But did you, perhaps, with your vain life or jesting manner, or light conversation, counteract all your words of persuasion. Well, certainly I cannot commend my life, yet I was most careful to set a good example. Yea, for this very thing they would tell me I was too precise, and that I denied myself of things in which they saw no evil. Indeed? Well, then thou must remember that Cain hated his brother, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. And, if thy wife and children have been offended with thee for this, they thereby show themselves to be implacable to good. Thou hast delivered thy soul from their blood. But I hope that they may yet see the error of their ways, and follow after. Now I saw in my dream that thus they sat talking together till supper was ready. So when they had made ready, they sat down to meat. Now the table was furnished with fine things to eat and drink, all provided by the Lord of the hill for the refreshment of pilgrims. Now at the table, all their talk was about the Lord of the hill and the great things he had done. Now I perceived by their description of him that he had been a great warrior and had fought with and slain him that had the power of death, but not without great danger to himself and the shedding of much blood, which made me love him all the more. 
But that which puts the more glory upon all his brave deeds was that he did it voluntarily, out of pure love to this country where we dwell. Ah, oh, such love is this, that did lead the Prince of Peace to lay down his glory, that he might do this for the poor. And he hath sworn that he will not dwell in Mount Zion alone, but that he will take us who are born as beggars upon a dunghill, and make us into princes and princesses. Thus they discoursed together until late at night. And after they had committed themselves to their Lord for protection, they betook themselves to rest. The pilgrim they laid in a large upper chamber, whose window opened toward the sun rising. The name of the chamber was Peace, where he slept till the break of day, and then he awoke. <sighs> oh, where am I now? Oh, yes, this is the love and care of Jesus for the men that pilgrims are thus to provide that I should be forgiven and dwell already near, next door to heaven. <laughs>